everyone, and as the man himself would say, let's get ready to rock. Or he would if this was the PC version of Duke Nukem 3D, but this is sadly not that. But that's getting ahead of things and possibly spoiling the review. Honestly though, was there any other way this could go? Anyway, my name is Dave and this is Algamoto, the only channel on YouTube dedicated to collecting and reviewing each and every English language release for the Master System Genesis, Sega CD, and 32X each and every week. And let's face it, if I'm going to make it through all these games before I keel over, this pretty much has to be a weekly thing, as there is a lot of material to go through. And right now at 111 episodes, we're only about 9% of the way there. Also, I've just been informed by my crack legal team at Lee and Rosenberg that I have no way of substantiating the previous claim about being the only channel that does this sort of thing. But hey, it, it sounds good, doesn't it? And if all this sounds good and something like you might be interested in, I recommend that you subscribe so that you'll know when new videos go up. Normally, I shoot for Monday or Tuesday morning, but I'll be honest, sometimes life doesn't adhere to a strict schedule. On this week's episode of Zalagamoto, we're looking at a game for the Genesis but it might be more accurate to call this a Mega Drive release. The reason why I say that is because this week's game, Duke Nukem 3D, originally didn't come out for the Genesis. Instead, it was a Brazilian exclusive released in September of 1998 for the Mega Drive by Tech Toy. If you haven't heard of Tech Toy, they're the Sega's distributor in Brazil, and the reason why Master System had such an unusually long lifespan in the region and the source of various other Brazilian Master System exclusives that you probably wouldn't expect to exist, like Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat 3. And yes, 1998 is extremely late for a Mega Drive release as well, and this case coming a year after the release of Duke Nukem 3D for the Saturn in the United States. However, what we're looking at today is not the Brazilian Tech Toy release of Duke Nukem 3D, but instead the re-release for the Genesis from Pico Interactive that hit the market in October of 2015. While it would be kind of cool to have the original Mega Drive release, seeing as how this is the exact same game except with the addition of a Pico Interactive screen on boot up, I couldn't justify trying to find and pay for the original Brazilian version. And to Pico Interactive's credit, that was a good decision, as the packaging that we'll get to in a minute is much improved from the original release, featuring a manual not written in Portuguese. This release for Duke Nukem 3D is something I've been very curious about for a long time, as the original release for the PC was a revelation in gaming, and one of those games that is so revolutionary, the best way to describe it is with a quote from Rowdy Roddy Piper. Just when you think you have all the answers, I change the questions. Like many people, I first played the shareware version of Duke Nukem 3D for PC in early 1996, and as soon as I was able, I had my mom take me to Electronics Boutique to pick up the full version. Unfortunately, the original box and mouse pad are long gone, but I did manage to hold on to the game itself, broken case and all, and is actually one of my oldest possessions. To say that Duke Nukem 3D means a lot to me is an understatement, and even though I knew the Genesis was ill-equipped to properly handle a 3D shooter, after playing Bloodshot about a year ago, I had hope for something resembling the original game. So, were those hopes validated, or were they blown to bits worse than a pig cop eating a pipe bomb? We shall see, but first, a look at that revised package. And here is the Pico Interactive release of Duke Nukem 3D. This is the first time I've reviewed a Pico Interactive game on the channel, but it won't be the last, as I currently own four others, and there's probably at least another four or five I'll be purchasing. I'm not looking to collect every post-1998 Genesis release, as some of the games out there are really just glorified tech demos trying to take advantage of people like me, but games like this that actually had original releases, just not in the US, or that were cancelled right before release, are definitely in my sights. One thing I want to make a point of mentioning here is the clamshell that Pico uses for their releases. It's not an exact copy of the original Sega clamshells, but it's very close and decent quality. I'm not sure if there's one company that makes all these, as the clamshell is used by the Crisis Twins, Zeno and Coffee, that I previously looked at in episodes 48 and 89, use what seem to be the same aftermarket clamshells. My only real complaint about these cases is the closing halves are a little weak. 
They function, but they just feel like they're a bit too easy to open. However, this is a minor complaint, and while it would be nice if these shells were a 100% replica of the original cases, similar to how close the RetroBit Genesis and Saturn controllers are, these are still a lot better than the cardboard boxes some unlicensed manufacturers have used. Moving on to the cover art, this is a pretty solid design. The original Brazilian release looks nice too, but it uses the later red band style, and I've just always preferred the earlier black crosshatch style. There's just one small problem that you can probably tell. Pico Interactive cut the inner cover wrong, and it's too far over to the left. It's a minor annoyance on the front cover, but as I move over to the spine, yeah, that looks rough. None of the other four games I got from Pico in the same order had this issue, so this is definitely just a quality control problem on this specific release. But I can't believe someone put this in a box and thought it was okay to ship. I probably should have complained when I got it, but at the time I thought they were just all like this, and I hadn't seen a copy that was centered properly. Moving on to the back, and the rear layout definitely resembles other earlier Genesis titles, with three good quality screenshots, and then some confusing text typing the game. The first two paragraphs clearly seem to just be referring to Duke Nukem 3D in general, but then the third paragraph gives you the ugly truth. This version features all new levels, and it's only the second episode from the original game, Lunar Apocalypse, complete with a nice little typo there. But then even this statement's confusing. Am I getting a port of the second episode from the original Duke Nukem 3D? Or is this a new collection of levels that has nothing to do with the original Lunar Apocalypse episode? It's not all bad news, though, as the game does feature battery backup for saves, which I wasn't expecting. But it does make sense, as finishing an entire episode of Duke Nukem 3D does take a few hours, especially when you don't know what you're doing. Opening up the package, and the label on the cartridge looks pretty sweet. However, there's no name at the top, which is an interesting design choice. The manual isn't super thick, but it is printed on nice, glossy stock and is in color, something you only see on unlicensed titles. It does what you expect a manual to do and explains all the weapons, items, and enemies that you'll face, along with laying out the controls. Other than the typos and the QC issues I had with the cover, the actual design here isn't bad, and like I said earlier, it's nice having a product that's not in Portuguese. Okay, that's the package. There's definitely a few things here that are concerning about the game, but I fully believe in not judging a book or a game by its cover. It's time to get some and see just what Tech Toy was able to squeeze out of the aging Genesis hardware. I spoke a little bit earlier about how much the original Duke Nukem 3D meant to me. Duke Nukem and Duke Nukem 2, the original side-scrolling PC games from Apogee, were from before I got into DOS gaming for the most part except for Wolfenstein and Doom, so my first exposure to them was as a bonus on the CD for the full version of Duke Nukem 3D, and that's just as well as I prefer to do my platforming on consoles. But Duke Nukem 3D doesn't require you to know anything about the past games in the series, it solely sits on its own. It does this by having a sprawling game in its original form consisting of 28 levels across three episodes, very similar to Doom's layout three years previous. The first episode from Duke Nukem 3D, LA Meltdown, has you exploring areas supposedly in and around Los Angeles before taking the fight directly to the invading aliens in space during the aptly named Lunar Apocalypse, and then finally there's more action in Earth-based levels during the original final episode, Shrapnel City. And while Doom had some slight variations in levels, starting out in UAC military bases before adventuring further and further into hell, Duke's levels were largely unique, exploring prisons, movie theaters, the sewer, Chinese restaurants, strip clubs, and numerous other areas. And not only were these levels largely different from one another, there's tons of interactivity in the levels as well, with plenty of secrets and easter eggs hidden here and there, and the occasional puzzle you have to solve. This combination of creativity and novel level design made Duke Nukem 3D the legendary game it is, and it's the reason why it had ports to the PlayStation, Saturn, N64, and Game Boy Advance, along with later ports to the more modern consoles. However, one thing should stand out about all those consoles I just mentioned, and that's that they are all much more powerful consoles than the Genesis. 
Yes, even the Game Boy Advance, which had more power under the hood than a lot of people realize, and wasn't simply just a portable Super Nintendo. This is a large problem when trying to port a game like Duke Nukem 3D, which, due to its nature, needs to have detailed graphics and run at a solid frame rate to be enjoyable at all. Well, guess what two things were sacrificed amongst a host of others for the Genesis version? Yep, you guessed it. And as a result, this port of Duke Nukem 3D runs as graceful as a hippopotamus and looks as bland as a rice cake. But perhaps I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. When playing the original Duke Nukem 3D on my PC, my least favorite episode was always the second one, Lunar Apocalypse. Why is that? Well, for the second episode, Duke goes to space to take on aliens directly, and as a result, the bulk of the episode takes place in very samey feeling space stations, with the action feeling very enclosed, as opposed to the primarily outdoor levels in the first and third episodes. Also, due to the levels taking place on space stations, a lot of the level variety is gone, as space stations, unsurprisingly, all apparently look the same. Don't get me wrong, Lunar Apocalypse is still decidedly Duke, but if I'm going to replay a level, it's probably not going to be from one of those. Now, if you missed the section earlier where I looked at the back of the package, you might be asking yourself why I just spent a paragraph talking about Lunar Apocalypse exclusively. Well, there's unfortunately a very good, or bad depending on your perspective, reason for that. You see, due to the lower power of the Genesis, to even attempt to cram Duke Nukem 3D onto the console, some cuts had to be made. And the easiest way to cut content is to reduce the number of levels included in the game. The 32X version of Doom ran into a similar situation, and rather than include the whole game, instead the entire third episode was cut. The developers here had a similar solution, but instead had to cut two episodes from the game. And which episode did they decide to retain and make the entire game about? You guessed it, Lunar Apocalypse. So even before putting the cartridge in the system, this port is already starting off on a bad foot with me. Oh, but wait, there's more. There's a lot more. In the Genesis version of Lunar Apocalypse, there are only nine levels compared to 11 in the original version. Now, granted, two of the 11 levels in the original game are hidden levels, so you could theoretically say that they both have the same amount of regular levels in 9. Beyond that, however, is when things get weird, even from just a structural standpoint. Of the 9 levels included in the game, only 4 actually share names with levels in the original game. Spaceport, Incubator, Occupied Territory, and the final level, Overlord, named for the final boss in both instances. Okay, so now we're dealing with a situation where over 50% of the levels have been altered and we have something totally new and different from the original game. So you're thinking, well, maybe those four levels they kept had the simplest designs, so they were able to at least reuse them and have something from the original game represented. Yeah, no. That over 50% of the levels has been altered is a true statement but that's because the actual number is 100%. Names aside, there are no levels from the original game included in the Genesis version of Duke Nukem 3D. Based on that, to even call this game a port of Duke Nukem 3D is highly questionable at best. So, what exactly is included here in these levels? Well, due to the fact that the Genesis would already have problems dealing with three-dimensional environments, these levels have been largely simplified. How simple? Well, I read a comment comparing level layouts to Wolfenstein 3D, and that's probably a decent corollary, but not exactly right. With Wolfenstein, every level is set up on a square block-based grid that's flat, with no elevation changes. In the Genesis Duke, the levels are flat as well, with no angles to walls, but the layout of the level isn't beholden to some square outer border, and the levels include multiple floors that can be reached via elevators in the levels. So even though the level segments are flat with no ramps or stairs, there are sections that theoretically stack on top of each other. And just like the original Duke Nukem 3D, the levels can contain up to three colored key cards, which would be required at certain points of the level to get through doors. Also, some levels contain the teleporters that would pop up occasionally in the original game to give the level design a bit more flexibility. 
But even with elevators and teleporters, there's only so much you can do with flat level design, and the game suffers from the same problem that plagues Wolfenstein, resulting in you oftentimes feeling more like a rat in a maze than a hero violently dispatching enemies and saving mankind. Even though the level structure doesn't resemble the original Duke Nukem 3D in any way, shape, or form, there are enough things here that have been carried over to make the game at least seem like a distant cousin that you would avoid at family get-togethers. From a weapons loadout standpoint, Duke still has his pistol, shotgun, chain gun, RPG, devastator, pipe bombs, and the mighty foot. But more exotic weapons like the freeze thrower, shrink gun, and laser trip bombs have been left out for good reason. A few of the items from the original game have been brought over as well, like the portable med kit, protective boots, and a spacesuit that was previously left on the cutting room floor, which is kind of neat to see, but not much else. And for enemies, we've got assault captains, assault commanders, the flying fat guys, enforcers, the guys with chain guns, pig cops, even though they weren't in the original Lunar Apocalypse due to only being on Earth, Octobrains, Protractor Drones, and Slimers. And in a pretty shocking development, the game offers up the ability to save anywhere, just like the original title via battery backup, something highly unusual for a console at the time, albeit with only one save slot available. So again, there's at least enough here to where I wouldn't necessarily call this Duke Nukem 3D, but I think saying that it's inspired by Duke Nukem 3D is accurate. And that paragraph contains the last good thing I'm going to say about this quote-unquote game. And calling it a game is a bit of a stretch, as Duke Nukem 3D for the Genesis more resembles a completely broken tech demo that never should have been released, much less sold for money. Even in the easiest difficulty level, the game is impossible. This is largely due to the controls, which require you to hold the B button down to strafe, and the fact that the enemies will always hit you for some damage, and the best you could hope for would be to very, very slowly make your way through each of the levels and save after killing every enemy, but only if you don't take very much damage. I was usually lucky to make it to the fifth enemy in the first level, as each one averages hitting you for about 20 points of damage, even when you know exactly where they are. I was this close to only including footage of that first two minutes of gameplay over and over again, but they included a god mode code, so I figured I would try to play through the whole game just to go through it. However, even with that code, there were more than a few times where I simply couldn't figure out how to continue in some of the levels, with no obvious doors or switches available. So I also had to use the level skip code as well, as believe it or not, being invincible wasn't enough to beat the game. Along with the fact that the game is impossible without cheating, the next thing that has to be discussed is the graphics. Now, the Genesis really shouldn't be able to process a 3D styled engine, as it lacks the scaling and rotation capabilities that say the Sega CD and the Super Nintendo had. And along with that limitation, the Genesis famously can only display 64 colors at a time, down from the original PC version's 256. The result is a game that looks washed out and has a frame rate that chugs based on how much is going on. However, beyond that, to cheat the Genesis into a form of scaling and rotation, the graphics are drawn using vertical lines. While it works, and the various sprites at least resemble their original form, after a few minutes of playing, it's hard on the eyes, making navigate through the game a test of your eye stamina, especially with the similar looking wall textures you're often presented with. The game audio isn't anything special either. The included sound effects do sound reminiscent of what's in the original game, but they're definitely a bit rough. And this may sound simple, but one of the great things about Duke Nukem 3D is Duke, voiced by John St. John. And unfortunately, most of Duke's lines have been removed from this release, contributing to the game just not having the same feel of the original title at all. All the in-game music isn't anything special either, and the Duke theme itself is totally ruined, only barely recognizable in comparison to the original, but I guess that's just a microcosm of the whole game. 
Duke Nukem 3D for the Genesis is a game that simply shouldn't exist. And that's not a compliment. This game literally never should have seen the light of day. It's a broken abomination on its own and a stain on the Duke series. In the 111 episodes of doing Xylog and Moto, it's a bad as game as I've seen. And come the end of the year, I'm going to have a very hard time deciding which is worse, this or Rise of the Robots. Yes, it's that bad. And as a result, it should be no surprise that I'm awarding Duke Nukem 3D for the Genesis a bomb rating. And may God have mercy on the souls of the developers, who didn't even credit themselves anywhere, instead including the credits from the PC version. Probably a smart move on their part, as I wouldn't want anyone knowing I was responsible for this software abortion either. Okay, that was Duke Nukem 3D for the Genesis, and just as soon as I get this video uploaded to YouTube, I'm going to take another hot shower and pull out the 20th anniversary World Tour edition of Duke for the Xbox and try to forget I ever played this game. I've absolutely wasted a lot of time in my life, but I'm not sure if I've ever wasted it as badly as the two and a half hours I spent capturing footage from the game today. It's not often I feel guilty about playing a game, but that's where I'm at right now. Next week on Zalagamoto, it's time for another sports sequel. And I can just imagine some of you groaning out there and getting ready to ignore next week's video in advance. And that's fine. I, I get it. Not all these reviews are going to be super interesting for everyone. But for me, this game takes me back to a special moment in basketball growing up, as it signifies the end of the Showtime era of the Lakers, with Magic Johnson officially turning the keys to the NBA over to Michael Jordan. Please remember to subscribe if you like this video, and remember... Whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later.